today and then the rest of the week. So what we'll do today is review uh, hash code equals and equals equals. I feel like I've uh, confused a bunch of you uh, in the last, last time. Uh, so we'll go over that and then we'll go over the, the FOB lecture lab which is uh, posted up there. So hopefully some of you have started. Uh, we didn't have much time to actually do it in the last lecture. So that will be our second thing. And then we'll cover a new topic, extracting a class diagram. So this is going to be essentially the last thing we will cover before the midterm. Okay, this will be the last uh, kind of bit of new information. And at the very end of uh, the lecture, we're going to talk about Java docs, which you need to write for phase one. Hopefully you're writing those, so I'll explain exactly what that means. And then we'll talk about debugging uh, with stack traces. A uh, couple of other notes. So I have extra office hours. You're welcome to come by today, uh, as well as on Thursday tomorrow at 10 in the morning, and then Friday at 11 in the morning. So just drop by during those times. If you have any questions, you know, or even if you don't have questions, just drop by and you can hear what other people are struggling with and uh, and learn something. So the the plan for Friday is to then do a lecture lab on this new topic. So today we're going to talk about how to extract class diagrams from code. And then you get to practice this on Friday. Uh, Monday, Monday of course, is uh, the start of a new phase in the project. And phase two of the project, unfortunately for you, is more difficult than phase one of the project. Um, but it's also much more fun. So in this kind of phase, you're, you know, in phase one, you're really parsing data and you don't have an artifact, you don't have an application that you're interacting with. At the end of phase two, you actually have an application. You have an Android app that you can run on your computer or on your phone. And that will allow you to actually you know, experiment with it, you know, take it home, do whatever you want to do with it. It's going to be more interesting too because your application will talk to other people as well. So we'll go over the details of the project, but you know, essentially it's one of these kind of social, social-like systems where you get to post your location and other people get to see it. So, you know, there's a lot of you, so hopefully there'll be a lot of activity and the project will be more fun. Okay, and then Wednesday, Wednesday's the midterm. We have kind of a similar, similar approach to the midterm this time. We're going to have the embargo again. It's going to be running from Tuesday at midnight to the time of the midterm. Uh, the only exception to that is really lecture. So there'll be no office hours on Wednesday. So you really need to come today, tomorrow, or Friday in order to talk to me. So don't come to me on Wednesday next week because <laughs> I'm not going to be around. So midterm number two is in the evening on Wednesday. And we're going to use the lecture time on Wednesday to actually do a QA. So just like last time, you'll come with questions. And you know I'll be answering questions for you front of the class. And the, the Piazza has been updated with all of the topics that we need to, that you need to know for midterm number two. And they're actually, each one is indicated with, you know, the topic that is specifically covered by midterm, midterm number two. Any questions about the schedule? Yeah. We have to go to lab. You have to go to lab. Uh, yeah, if you want to do well in the project, you should go to lab. <laughs> You should go to everything you can, you know, that would be my suggestion. I mean, it depends on what you're struggling with, right? I mean, not, you know, nothing's required, you don't have to be here, you know, but hopefully you're learning something and you'll do better on exams and so forth. 
Other questions about the schedule or where we are with stuff, with topics? Okay. So who's confused about hash code? Raise your hand. Higher, come on. Confusion. All right, great. Lots of confusion. So in order to understand hash code, in order to review it, you really have to understand it in the context of the type hierarchy that you have in Java. So, you know, the, the prerequisite diagram here is that Java has a built-in type called object. Right, it's a class. And this built-in type is what all of the types that you add to your, to your project are going to subclass. Okay, so you might have uh, another type. Uh, let's call it car. Right, and it's going to extend object. And that happens by default. Okay, so you have no control over this. This is just the way it works. If you create a car, this relationship already exists. So the key thing to know is that this object class defines a couple of methods. All of the classes that you'll create will inherit those methods because of the subtyping relation. Okay? So there'll be a couple of methods in here, one of which is going to be hash code, the other which will be equals. So to really understand hash code and equals, you have to understand the default behavior of these two methods. So they exist in every class. Okay, so they exist in the background and you use them all the time. So you better know how they work before you create your own. Okay? Because when you create your own, you're changing them and you have to follow certain rules when you change them. And you have to know exactly what new behavior you're introducing into the system. So the default behavior for these is that equals, so these are the default versions, is going to compare references. And hash code will just return the reference of the object. So what do I mean by this? So if I have an object like car C equals new car, let's say I give it a constructor like Toyota in a year, 2010. Okay, so I have a kind of a kind of newish Toyota up there. I call it C. Now, what the C is, it's a variable. And really, the way to think about it is that it's a reference. It's a reference to some memory location where I have a car object. This memory location contains stuff that a car has. So it knows that this is a Toyota. It knows that the year of this car is 2010. So that's what happens when I create a new car. So if I were to create a second car, car C2, and let's say I was going to call it the same thing. It's just going to say it's a Toyota, and it's also a 2010 model. So the C2 is going to point to a different car. It has the same contents. But because I have a new, you know, two new statements, I have two memory locations that contain a car. So I have two of these. They're different. Right? So when I run equals and I do C dot equals C2, this will evaluate to false. Because my default version of equals compares references. And C1 and C2 do not refer to the same object. They refer to two different memory locations. Likewise, if I do C dot hash code, this evaluates to some number. This number is not going to be the same thing as C2.hashcode. Can you move it up, please? How about that? So if I run hash code on both objects, C and C2, I'll get two different values. 
because they're two different references. So this is our default behavior of hash code and equals. And the reason we create new versions of hash code and equals is because sometimes this is not what we want. Right? This behavior is not desirable if you have C and C2 that actually contain identical things. So if my car is a Toyota and it's from the same year, maybe I actually want those to be evaluated to the same thing. Right? I want them to be identical. So note that I could actually, you know, having the same hash code and equals, I could say something like C2 equals C. Right? And when I do this, my pointer from C2, it starts pointing this way. And when this is, when I, when I evaluate this statement, then my C does equal C2 and my hash codes are the same. Okay, so references may be useful. Like if they were pointing to the same object, perhaps equals and hash code is an okay behavior. The default versions are okay to have. Yeah. Say again? Is the other Toyota gone? Like, what happens to the other object? The other object. The other object is still a memory. It's still somewhere in memory. And the real answer depends on whether other things are pointing to it. Okay. If there's something else pointing to it, it still exists in memory. So, this default behavior is sometimes useful, sometimes not. It sort of depends on your context. So, if I don't like this default behavior, I'll create a new version of hash code, a new version of equals, and I put them into my car. So this is just like plain overriding. Right? I have a method in the parent, I have a child, subclass, I'm going to override that method in the subclass. I'm going to override it to do whatever I want. So if I wanted to, I could say, well, my car, so I have some class for my car. And I'm going to override and say that int hash code of my object is going to be simply perhaps this dot year. Right, so maybe I just say the hash code representation of a car is just the year that it was made. So I could choose to do that. This year is some integer, and I'm just going to return this integer. Um, could C2 be called C? You mean could I reverse these? Uh, no. When you make it C2, could you just call it C as well? Is that yeah, that's right. I could, I could have done car C2 equals C instead of this. Is that what you meant? Uh, what did you mean? Like, I meant to, like, if they had the same name, would they be the same as well, or would they, they would be different objects? I guess so. Like if C2 was C. So if I did car C2 equals what? Car C. Car C. Car, no, the, the, that one? Uh -huh. If you did car C equals new car, would they be the same, or would they, still, would they would still be different objects? It would be a different object. Every time you call the new keyword, you're creating a new object. Okay? And this assignment will just simply, simply determines where the variable points to. Okay. So if this was car C equals new car, then this C would be redirected to point to this thing, to the new version of car. Okay. All right, so this is, this is a feasible version of hash code. Okay. So this version of hash code has to be always consistent with my equals. So this is a requirement when you write hash code and equals. So you can't just write one and then not write the other. You have to write both. Which is why in Eclipse, when you generate hash code and equals, you generate both at the same time. It doesn't allow you to generate just one. You must generate both. And the rule is that if you have two objects, two objects like O1 and O2, 
say object one and object two. Then if I have object one dot equals object two, then this must imply that object one dot hash code is equals to object two dot hash code. It's a little messy. But this is a requirement. If my two objects are the same, they must have the same hash code. Okay? So when if I overwrite hash code and I say that just use year as my hash code, then I just violated this property. Because I'll be using the original equals up here. And then I'll be using the hash code down here. Right, these two guys. You can't see them on the same page. So I'll be using a combination of these. So if my two objects are, well, in this case, ooh, in this case, I think it, is, it does actually work out, right? My two objects are equal because they have identical references, meaning they both point to the same thing. Then they have identical hash code. So in this case, it worked out. Right? But in some cases, it doesn't work out. So that's where you have to override both methods. So you'll provide an override for your equals as well. OK, so this is what you should have in your mind. When you're creating objects, you're creating these bubbles. And then your variables point to one of those bubbles. OK, so when you're comparing objects, the default behavior is to say, are you pointing to the same bubble? And then if you don't like that behavior, you can change it. And then you have to say explicitly, what does it mean for two bubbles to be the same? Is it the name of the car? Is it the year of the car? Is it the car's you know, color? What is it? So you have to state that. Yeah. Um, since when you create two objects, you know, even if they're the same, they have, you said they have different hash codes. So by default, what would determine the hash code of the object? What is the object's hash code by default? We define what determines the hash code, but So you're asking what the default behavior of hash code is? Yeah, like what would, what would determine, what function would make the hash code in, like, by default? Right? Yeah, the default behavior of hash code looks at the memory location of the bubble and just returns the memory location, right? So it just tells you this is located at address, you know, OX FDA AV01. That's like hexa, hexadecimal number that represents where this bubble is located in memory. Okay, because memory is just this long contiguous array of cells where you can put stuff, right? And each of these cells has a number associated with it. So you start counting, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. Right, so my car might be located at 4, and my other car might be located at 6. Okay. So when I'm talking about these bubbles, they really should think of them as being located somewhere in memory. Yeah. Um, so like you already overwrote hash code to return the year. Um, do you still need to override equals since you know, just compare the value of year? So in this case, it's actually consistent, right? So if I wrote it this way, then this property is preserved. But there are cases where you can overwrite it where it's not preserved, right? Which is why in Eclipse, when you generate hash code or you generate equals, it generates the other version as well. You can only generate both at the same time. I mean, it seems like you can just write the hash code and not overwrite equals if you do it in certain ways. It's not always the case. Um, still access the, um, the memory reference by calling the super, the super hash code? Yeah, you could do super dot hash code, sure. If you wanted to use the reference, so if I wanted to use my original hash code, I could do super dot hash code here. But if I did that, then why overwrite hash code? So I could use it in computation in some way. James? Um, 
provide inside boxes, offering one object to offering one for All right, so this is a logical formula. And this is, this is an implication of the formula. And it says that if this statement is true, if my two objects are equal, meaning object one that equals object two returns true, then this must be true. That is, the number returned by hash code call of object one must be the same as the hash code return for object two. So you must maintain this property. For, so this relates equals and hash code. In some sense, this is a class invariant. Right? So all classes in Java must satisfy this invariant. An invariant is just a property that must be true about your program, about your class. OK, so this is your view. Come to office hours to ask more questions. So let's look at this lecture lab. <coughs> so the original lecture lab for FOB was to check out FOB. By the way, you need to check out a bunch of projects. They're listed all in the front. So the first one is going to be FOB. So in FOB, if you run the test for FOB, then you'll see that there's some tests that fail. Okay, and so the, the point of the lecture lab was to figure out why is it failing and fix it. So it's a very kind of standard debugging exercise. You're probably going through it right now. You have some tests failing in your project. You need to figure out what's wrong and fix them. So in this case, you know, the, the first step should always be, you know, I have a test that's failing. Where is it failing? So at the very bottom, you have a stack trace which will tell you exactly where the problem is, or at least where it failed. So if you double click this problem, it brings you to the line of code, the fending line of code where your program stopped. And the issue here is that this assert true does not evaluate to true. It evaluates to false. And so my program stops because I expected true, but what I got was false. So this pop controller has access, somehow returned false, while I was expecting true. So first step in debugging, you know, I can't figure it out from here why this is not working. So I need to jump into the has access function and look at this function. And think about kind of control flow. So the same thing that you did, you know, in the first half of the course where you drew control flow models, you essentially have to do that in your head when you look at this code. So how can I return false from this method? Any ideas? Right. So here's my return. How can I get to this line of code? Well, one way to get there is to evaluate false on this conditional. For that, fob would have to be null. So I'll go back here and say, well, this parameter f1 that I'm passing, is it ever null? It's not null because I'm creating a new fob object here. So that, that's not going to work out. So that means when I come into this code, you know, the, I go into this inner, inner if statement. But I still return false. So the only conclusion to draw here is that this thing evaluates to false. Right? So the only way I can get to this return false is if this one evaluates to false, or, sorry, if this one evaluates to false, or if this one evaluates to true, and this one evaluates to false. So how can this guy evaluate to false? So I have to think about the contains key function. So this user map thing is a map. My keys in this map are fobs, and my values are users. So when I say contains key, it's a question of whether my user map contains the fob that I was passed in. And if it evaluates to false, that means the fob that I was passed in is not part of the map. Or my hash code is messed up, and my equals method is messed up. Because the way I look things up in the map is by using hash code. 
Right, so in order for me to check whether my user map contains Bob, I calculate the hash code of Bob. And then I check if that hash code is in my user map. OK, so user map maybe doesn't actually have my fob. So let's find out what, where does this thing come from. So it's initialized somewhere in the constructor in my fob control unit. And then there's a call to initialize fobs. So my unit test, OK, so how could I initialize it? Well, I don't see any initialization statements here. That means that maybe there was a run before statement that executed before my test. So here it is, I create my controller unit, and then I initialized it with some set of fobs and users. So what kind of fobs do I have? Here they are. Here are all the fobs that I have in my map when I initialized it. So you'll notice that the offending fob is F1, and F1 is 25522. So my question here is, is 25522 one of the fobs that I added to the map? 25522, here it is. So it seems like my map actually contains the right fob. So I'm going through a process of elimination. So the first step is to figure out the control flow. How did I get where I got? What must have been true? And then to figure out why am I not getting the right expected behavior. So I did not evaluate that if statement to true for some reason. So therefore, I have to inspect the actual map and find out what it contains. So this contains key evaluated to false, but my map does have the expected fob. So the only option then is that this fob hash code evaluate to some, some unknown value, some value that's not in my map. And what's in my fob? My fob doesn't define a hash code, doesn't define an equals. So it's using the default equals, the default hash code. Right? Which means that if I created a new fob in my test, like here, I created a new fob, it will never equal any fob that has been created before. Because when I create a new object, I create a new reference, create a new location in memory to store it. So there's no way this test can pass with the default hash code method. So the, the solution here is to generate the hash code for the fob method and generate equivalently the, the equals. So the automated solution here is to, to run this thing, source, generate hash code and equals. So if you run this, it'll ask you what should be included in my comparison of hash of fobs. And I'll say, well, the length of the display sequence doesn't matter. It's a constant. Usually constants use uppercase letters. The display sequence doesn't matter. It's really just a unique ID. That's what I want to compare when I'm comparing fobs. So that's what I'm going to generate. It'll generate my hash code. It'll generate my equals. It's great. I don't have to do this work. Now we can test whether my my test passes after I implemented this. And it does. Right, so step one, find out what your control flow is. Step two, make sure that your data structures are used correctly. And that's the whole point behind hash code and equals and equals equals. Because those methods are used by the data structures to find out whether they contain the right things and so forth. Okay? So that's FOB. Okay, let's get to do some fun extraction of class diagrams. Yeah, no. So you're, um, when you did source, uh, generate hash, hash code in the, um, uh, the it, does, it does the, like your, your code, you the weakness for you, basically. Yeah, when I generate hash code in equals, it generates the version of hash code and equals that are, first of all, consistent. They respect that invariant that I talked about. And second of all, it, they compare and hash just the fields that I care about. 
right? So an object typically contains a bunch of fields, but for two objects to be equal of that class of object, you may decide that it's just a subset of the fields that matter. So for a car, it might be just you know, the manufacturer, <coughs> or just a year, or it might be all of those things. So that's why there was that wizard where I clicked the specific fields. Okay, let's talk about extraction. So this whole UML sequence diagram stuff that we've been talking about has mostly been focused on the case where you have some model and you convert the model into code. So somehow, you know, the user, which is you, created this model and then you decided that this model represents what you want out of your program and then you converted it to code. So this code could be Java, it could be a bunch of things. These models could be UML you know, sequence diagrams, they could be class diagrams. There's lots of different kinds of models. So this was kind of the story so far. And today we're going to talk about the reverse. So what happens when you actually have a bunch of code and maybe it's code that you didn't write. Maybe it's code that is open sourced online. And you want to understand this code. And one way of understanding code is to do the reverse process. To take the code and then generate the model from the code. So the reason you do this is not to model, is not to model your problem domain. It's to understand what the program is doing. So it's a comprehension task. And the reason you want to do this is because sometimes this code is really ugly. So maybe you're really lucky and the person who wrote the code actually went through this process first and they documented everything and they have these nice models that you can look at. Then great, you don't need to do this. You just go and look at the models. But what's frequently the case is that you just have a bunch of code and the person didn't document it properly. Right? They didn't have they didn't add requires clauses or modifies clauses. They did not go through this process. They do not have a UML class diagram for you. So you're going to do the reverse. Okay? And so this is what we're going to do today. So those two projects in the middle, Robust Intersection Complete and Space Invader Refactored, are the ones that we're going to use as test cases and extract UML class diagrams for. So let's start with the first one, the Robust intersection complete. So here's, uh, here's a short demo of, of this app. It's really easy and kind of silly. So you have two traffic lights. It's an intersection, right? You can run it and then you can advance the traffic lights. Wow. It's very fancy. So you can advance things, right? And it's an intersection, so serious. You know, you have to make sure that things are in lockstep, that they're behaving correctly. If you have two green lights, disaster, right? So it has some software to control and make sure that they're doing the right thing. And that's what the little app demonstrates. And then you have colors that you can choose. So you can say that, well, I want a purple traffic light. Uh, and you're like, no, only in California. You know, can't do that. So then you can set it to different things. Right? So it's a really simple, simple app. So we want to understand this app. You know, you haven't seen it before. You open up the source code and you say, what's in my source code? How, what is the design of the software? How do I attempt to understand it? And it has quite a few classes. So the first step you can do is actually look at the model. So it has a nice model package. And you look at the model and you say, well, there's some classes. So the first thing I can do is actually just write my class diagram in terms of classes and ignore the fields and the methods. Right, so let's just do the class diagram where I capture relationships, associations, inheritance, and composition. So here's my, 
intersection class. So far, so good. I have one class, I got one box. My intersection class has the following data. It knows about traffic lights. It has two of them. And traffic light is another class in my, in my project. So what I have is another box for traffic light. I have some kind of relationship between these. The reason I know that is because my intersection knows about traffic lights. And my intersection knows about exactly two traffic lights. And there are two because if I look in the constructor, it actually initializes both of them. So there are actually two references to real traffic lights after the constructor ends. Now, I don't know if this is unidirectional or bidirectional. Because to figure that out, I actually have to look at the traffic light. So what does the traffic light know? The traffic light just has a bunch of strings in it. So that means this relationship is unidirectional. My intersection knows about two traffic lights. So what else can I, can I model? I have other GUI elements in my software. So I can look at what does my intersection GUI know? So my intersection GUI is going to be another class. So I draw a box for it. And my intersection GUI has references to a traffic light GUI. It also has reference to intersection. So when I create my intersection GUI, I know that, well, do I know the traffic intersection? Is it ever set? Here it is. My traffic intersection is going to advance. So my intersection GUI knows about an intersection. I know that it's one directional because intersection did not have a reference to my intersection GUI. Right, so it knows about exactly one intersection. And then there's also the traffic light GUI. So there's two of them. So I'll add that as an element. Traffic light GUI. And I see there's an association this way. And there's exactly two of them here. So now I'll look at traffic light GUI to kind of complete the picture. So what does it know? Well, it knows about intersection GUI. So this relationship is bidirectional. It's one to two. And does it know anything else? doesn't look like it, right? So this is my UML class diagram that I extracted from the code. So if you look at this class diagram, you can actually understand something about how the code works. You can understand something about dependencies within my code. Uh, how do you differentiate between an arrow of composition and an arrow of extents? Because it seems like the same arrowhead. Yeah, so extents is a, yeah, there's a bunch of arrows that you have to know. So this arrow, like so, is an association arrow. If you have an arrow that is like so, a triangle, right, then this is an extens. Does it have to be um, white in the middle, or can it be multiple people? Yes, it needs to be exactly like this. <laughs> the modeling community, they're very, they're very serious about their error. <laughs> so if you have a dashed line and the same kind of error head, then this is an implements relationship. Okay. 
So in this case, we didn't have any inheritance. So we didn't see the extensor implements. But in later ones, you will. And then there's one more. And that's what we've been calling composition. But it's actually a misnomer. This thing is actually aggregation. Really, you haven't learned about the fourth one, you know, or whatever the next one is. So aggregation and composition are, you can treat them identically. Yeah. Um, there's there's a one next to intersection between intersection and traffic light, but traffic light doesn't contain any intersections. So like, is the one there? What does that represent? Yeah. So you don't actually need the one. It's not it's not necessary. So like, I left out the one here, for example. Okay. But so. You could leave it in for extra clarity, but it's not essential. Yeah? As you said, if the top relationship was unidirectional and that the bottom relationship like between intersection GUI and traffic light GUI was bidirectional. Right. But um, wouldn't bidirectional be when there's two arrows on either side, or is that implied even though they're not there? Yeah, so when you have an arrow that looks like this, it automatically converts another arrow into just a line. Okay. Sorry, maybe I'll do something like this. Yeah, so in fact, there are arrowheads at both ends. And when there are arrowheads at both ends, you would just omit them. Okay. So that's the, that's the standard notation. Okay, so great. We extracted a model. Let's do the same thing for space invaders refactored. So we have another project. Open up that project, Space Inventors Refactored, close everything else, and let's look at what it contains. So my Space Invaders Refactored, uh, you know, SI game is a good place to start. So I draw an SI game. And then I see what it has. Well, it has a bunch of sprites as a list of sprites. So it knows about multiple instances of sprites. And sprite is, is in my project. Oh, here it is, yeah. So here's a sprite. So I know about multiple sprites. And when I create an SI game, I create a new set of sprites, new array list. And then I execute setup. And if I go to setup, then I'll create a tank, and then I'll add the tank to my sprites. So at the end of my constructor, I executed the setup method. My sprites array is going to contain one sprite, Okay, the tank. So the way I show this here is I create a sprite class. And I know there's a relationship. It's not one here, because it's not one sprite, because it's a list of sprites. So there could be more than one. But there's definitely one, at least one. Because by the time my constructor runs, I have one sprite in my list. So that means the cardinality here is one dot 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 n. If anywhere between one and n sprites. Then I can look inside of Sprite, and I can say, what does a Sprite know about? Just knows about some coordinates. So this relationship is going to be unidirectional, where my one SA game instance knows about one or more Sprites. How do you know it's at least one? Because in the constructor, it's just um, initializing the list. Yeah, if you look at the constructor, so all of this, you know, we're drawing these diagrams with respect to the constructors. So you're not going to need to look outside of the constructor, except if they're method calls. So here's the constructor for SI game. It creates a new array list. And here it seems like it's going to be empty. So if I did nothing else, then this would be 0 dot dot n, right? Because it could be empty. But setup actually creates a sprite and then adds one to my list of sprites. That's why this relationship is 1 dot dot n. 
So the other thing my essay game knows about is a tank. So I'm going to draw my tank instance, my tank class. And I know that I create one when I have a game. So this is going to be one. Let's see what the tank knows about. Tank has a bunch of, you know, integers and colors. Doesn't know much. So it doesn't know about the SA game instance. So this relationship is one to one. So we've covered SA game, we've covered sprite, and we've covered tank. Oh, there's one more relationship in tank. What am I missing? Lucas? Yeah. My tank extends sprite. So I'm missing an error. So my tank extends sprite. Um, when it says SI, SI game does I, like, that's not something. No, no, no. Oh, this thing. Yeah, so this is a reference. It knows about SI game because SI game is a class that is a public class. So it knows about the class SI game, but it doesn't know about any instance of SI game. Okay, so it can reference it, but it doesn't actually maintain a reference to an object of SI game. And this is what the model is represented actual objects. Yeah, you look at the fields as well as the constructor. So if there was a field in here that was SI game S, right, then I know that it knows about zero more, about zero or one SI games. And whether it's initialized or not in the constructor will determine whether it's zero or one. Right? Maybe it's always one. Okay, let's do the other one. So we have spray missile. Missile extends spray. So that's another subclass. Knows about nothing. Nothing else. So I have a missile class. It's going to extend spray. And I have an invader. Looks very similar. All of them are subclasses of sprites. And then the big pieces that are left are actually the UI pieces. So I say, let's look at Space Invaders. So Space Invaders is a class. I'm going to add it in. And what does the Space Invaders know about? It knows about SA game. So it has exactly this reference to SA game. Knows about game panel and score panel, which are two new classes. So Space Invader <coughs> knows about SA game. And it's unidirectional because I know that SA game did not have a reference to Space Invaders. And my SA game, well, this is where I create my SA game in my constructor. So it's exactly one. And then I have a game panel and a score panel. Create these guys down there. And I have exactly one instance for each in my Space Invaders. So Space Invaders knows about, oops, wrong arrowhead. Knows about one game panel, and it knows about one score panel. And then the final thing that I have to do is actually go to each of those classes and find out about what they know. So if I go to game panel, it knows about SA game and nothing else. So my game panel will have something very similar looking, like so. 
and my score panel has a reference to SA game, and that's the one I care about. So it also resembled this pattern. Voila. So this was a way of extracting models from the code. This will help me understand what the system does. And if I want to change it, I can first reason about my change in terms of the model before actually writing new code. So we'll get to practice more of this on Friday. I don't know. Apparently I'm doing it. 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 I'm doing it.